Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 15. As soon as it was night, the brothers and sisters sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Upon arrival, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. The people were more no, the, here the people were a more noble character than those in Thessalonica, since they received the word with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Consequently, many of them believed, including a number of prominent Greek women and men as well. But then the Jews from Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul of Berea. They came there too, agitating and upsetting the crowds. Then the brothers and sisters immediately sent Paul away to, the, to go to the coast. But Silas and Timothy stayed there. Those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And after receiving instructions from Silas and Timothy to come to him as quickly as possible, they departed. Will you pray with me? Our Lord and our God, our only hope in life and death is that we are not our own, but that we belong to you. Our souls are nourished by doing your will, and our minds flourish in the study of your word. So we long to be honorable like the Bereans. So instill in us a passion to study the scriptures and to know you through them. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. How's everybody doing? Great. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good news. That's news uh, to my ears there. Hey, listen, uh, this morning we're going to be in that very passage. We're going to kind of stay pretty tight there in that paragraph. I want to tell you this. Uh, the culture, the world, will disciple you to be shallow, to think in shallow ways. But in this room, I'm going to disciple you differently. And so today, I'm going to ask you to put on your thinking caps. Now, not everything that I have in this short, brief outline <laughs> in your bulletin, uh, you're going to be able to metabolize today. Not, you're not going to be able to do all of that. Uh, but my notes, my original notes will be on the web. So if you find that there's anything of interest that I say and you want to explore it further or get exactly what I said, uh, the transcript will be, uh, will be online this week, probably by the end of the day. Uh, so uh, I just want to welcome you. You know, guys, I have really looked forward to this message. I've looked forward to spending this hour with you. It is the, my favorite hour. Other than my date with my wife on Fridays, it's my favorite hour uh, of the week. And uh, we're going to be looking at this church in Berea. And what I love about this passage, what I love about these people, is I feel a kind of sympathetic resonance. This story, this happened 2,000 years ago. And when I read it, when I sit and I read it, I see myself sitting there in Berea, just voraciously wanting to learn and study the scriptures and verify that this teaching is according to the scriptures. And I remember when I was a teenager and I had first come to the Lord, and I was going to this, uh, this church, this very large church, and I remember just, sit, I was brand new in the faith, and I would sit on the front row on the edge of my seat taking notes, doing everything I could to absorb as much as I could because I was so hungry for the Word. And I was so hungry, and I wanted to be just like my pastor, Dr. Bob Roden. I was like, someday I'm going to know the stuff that he knows, and I'm going to be able to preach the way he preaches. And I'm not there yet, that's for sure, but I'm getting there. And that's why I love these people, and that's why I love this story. It's just you, it just strikes a chord from the ancient world in my own heart, and I hope it strikes a chord in yours. And what Luke is trying to show us today are the marks of a nobler culture. He's trying to show us what the marks of a nobler culture are, and we're going to look at them. And the first one is this. Luke defines noble character as eager and diligent study of the Word. He defines noble character clearly in this passage, as diligent study of the Word. He says these folks were of nobler character. Why? Because they were eager to receive the message from Paul and Silas, and because they studied it day and night, because they looked into it diligently, and they wanted to see if what Paul was saying is what was lining up with the Scriptures. And so Paul and Silas are sharing with them the message of Christ. And Paul is taking them back to their Old Testament, and he's showing them Jesus in the Old Testament. Now, how are these believers studying the Word? Some of the ways in which they studied the Word, these Jews in the first century, will be different than the ways that you do. It'll be a little bit different than the way that you and I are trained to study it today. So I'm going to look at their principles, 
I'm going to give you a crash course in Jewish hermeneutics. Yay, right? So fun. I'm going to give you a crash course in Jewish interpretational methods, and then I'm going to give you some of the core bedrock interpretational procedures that in the church uh, we follow today. So Jewish interpretive methods also go by the name of midrash, which means exposition. So when you hear a Jewish person talk about midrash, they talk about halakhic midrash or uh, haggadic midrash, this is what they're talking about. They're talking about a method of interpreting the Scripture, and they're somewhat different than our methods. So I'll mention the first one, halakhic regulation. Yay, isn't this fun? Don't you just feel your mind like just expanding right now? Okay, halakhic regulation. The word halakha means the way. So when in the Old Testament in Exodus, when he tells them you are to learn the law and walk in the way, this is what it means. It's the law that leads to the way. And so these are regulatory demands. When you see Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount, okay, I want to teach you how to read that passage. When you see Jesus stand up and say to those people six times, he gives them six legalisms. He says, you have heard Moshe say, You have heard it read, but I tell you thus and such. He is giving you halakhic regulation. He is giving the church, he is giving the disciples there on the hillside halakhic midrash. He's telling them this is the new law, and this is to regulate, to be the regulatory principle of your life. Men, don't just not commit adultery with women who are not your wives. Don't even think about them that way. Jesus is laying down the law, okay? This is halakha. But there is also Haggadic Midrash, Haggadic Midrash, or Midrash Haggadah. And this is expansive moralizing from character studies or narratives. Now, if Halakha is teaching the law out of the law, then Midrash or uh, uh, Haggadah is teaching a binding principle out of a story. So now this is where the rabbi or the teacher will take a narrative. He'll go back to the story of Noah. And he'll say, now, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be, right? So he's not teaching you halakha. He's not teaching you a binding regulatory principle. What he's teaching you is uh, a moral example. He's saying, just as it was in those days, in that character's life, so will it be today. Remember when Jesus was challenged about eating, like his disciples are picking the, the grains of wheat and they're eating them in the field? It's the Sabbath day. The Pharisees are watching them like a hawk. And the scribes and Pharisees come up to him and say, hey, you're, you're, uh, you're breaking the Sabbath. What does Jesus say? Do you remember David? Remember on the Sabbath when David went in and he ate the shoe bread and all his uh, men ate the shoe bread? What is Jesus doing? Jesus is reaching back and he's practicing Haggadic Midrash. He's saying, this is the Haggadah, okay? This is the way that it happened back then and I am allowed to do this because I'm God, Right? So, so basically, he's saying, I have the right to do this, and it's scriptural. But then you also have peshat and pesher. What are peshat and pesher? Two interesting words. Well, peshat means the flat sense, or the literal exact historical sense. So this is where a rabbi would go to a text and tell you exactly what it means in its context for its day. And then pesher has to do, it refers to the analogical or the fuller sense. The analogical or the fuller sense. So now this is precisely what Paul is doing, okay, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You can write that uh, verse down, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. What he does in the first few verses there is he practices peshat. He says, remember uh, Moses. The days of Moses, what happened? The people were out in the wilderness. They drank all from the same spiritual drink. They drank from the same rock, and then he says that rock is Christ, right? And then he goes on to say all of these things happened as examples for us. So he's practicing both Peshat and Pesher. Peshat means he's referring to a historical story. He's saying that story happened in history, it happened in space, it happened in time, and now here are the principles by analogy to our life. This refers to Christ, and we all drink from that rock who is Christ, okay? So this is, we call this typology because that's what Paul calls it. Paul says these happen as types for us. They happen as types to teach us how to live in the gospel, right? And then you have what's called apocalyptic. Uh, What is the only apocalyptic book in the New Testament? Little Bible trivia moment. 
Revelation. Why do we call Revelation apocalyptic? Well, the word revelation in Greek is the word apocalypsis, and it means to reveal, to unveil, to disclose. Now, the book of Revelation is not revelation, okay? The book of Revelation, not for the people who don't know the codes. If you don't know the cipher keys, the book of Revelation was intended to actually be cryptic. It was intended to be hidden from you. And this is how ancient Jewish apocalypse works. It works at this level. What happens is, is that God, it shows you God working in history as God stands sovereignly over history. So that's what it's showing you. It's showing you a picture in symbolic, cryptic form of God working in and through history and then standing sovereignly over the course of human history. Now, when you read the book of Revelation, the next time you read it, notice how the pattern toggles. In one chapter, you'll be watching like the beast and the false prophet, and they're unleashing their wrath on the people of God, and the people of God are dying, and they're testifying. And so you see God working in history. And then the very next chapter, what do you see? You see God high and exalted, and the Lamb who is at the center of the throne and the 24 elders surrounding the throne, worshiping, glorifying the Lamb. You see that pattern, that alternating pattern there. It's trying to show you how God is working sovereignly in history and stands sovereignly over history, and it's doing it in cryptic codes. And if you don't know the codes, you can't read the book. Have you ever had trouble understanding the book of Revelation? Yeah, some of you are willing to admit that. (laughs) The reason you do is because you don't know the codes. If you were an ancient governor like Pliny the Younger who was dragging Christians before him and and torturing them on pain of death, they would renounce their faith. If you were an ancient governor doing that and you got a hold of their book called Apocalypsis, called Revelation, and you saw in it that it was talking about Babylon, you wouldn't care about that. But if you're a part of the community and you know that Babylon is code for Rome, you know what the meaning is. You see, the, the, the word Rome doesn't appear in, the, in Revelation one time, but it's a lot about Rome, you see. And so this is apocalyptic. It's not only a genre, it's a way in which they look at the world. It's a way in which they look at the world. And then lastly, wisdom exegesis. So what is exegesis? Exegesis just means to draw out. So wisdom exegesis has to do with sagacious instructions for life. These kinds of wisdom sayings permeate Old and New Testament, particularly in the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus' favorite wisdom saying is a parable. The Gospel of Luke says this, Jesus did not speak to the crowds at all without speaking in parables. These are wisdom sayings. So, and the Jews love these. Okay, so now Paul has shown up in Berea. Okay, he is there. He's taking them back to their Old Testament. They take the scroll out of the closet, out of the box, out of the ritual box. They unroll it, and Paul is showing them chapter after chapter, book after book, where their Messiah is in their Old Testament. And these people say, we're going to go study that. Okay, next Saturday, we'll meet you right here, but we're going to study it. And this is how they're studying it. This is how Jews read the text. This is how they read it. Why is that important for us? There are some principles, actually, that you and I draw from their principles of interpretation. Some we, we ignore, but others we don't. So what are our, what are our interpretive, interpretive principles today? I want to give you a few, okay? The first one is contextual exegesis. Contextual exegesis. Contextual just means to interpret the text in its own context. To interpret the text in its own context. What do we mean by that? Well, if I come up here and say, good morning, I was hit what would you think? Well, you would, you would want to know the context, right? You would want to know, uh, well, did, did Carrie slap you before, you before you left the house? Did you get in a car accident on the way? Did one of the teenagers, like, throw a spiral football and hit you in your temple, like, when you walked through the door? I mean, what is the context of the, of the phrase, I was hit? Context determines meaning. If you don't know the context, you don't know the meaning. And so when it comes to context, we always want to ask, what is with this text? Never, ever cite a passage alone. Never. Go to that passage, cite it, and then look at what flanks that passage. What is in the context? What is in the immediate context? You may also want to learn some historical context. 
Sometimes historical context can really help you to understand, which is what I try to do this a lot on Sunday mornings, not too much, but uh, some of you think it's too much, but uh, I, try to, I try to help us to get back into, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay, good, thank you. Um, but I try to get us back into the first century world and ask and, and, and just help us to hear these words as they would land on Jewish and Greek ears, right? And so we want to do that. We want to understand the historical context. Again, you also want to understand the literary context. Listen, if you're reading the Gospels, you're reading an ancient Roman biography. If you are reading the book of Revelation, you are reading an ancient Jewish apocalyptic prophecy. You are not in the same kind of book. You would not interpret the Gospel of Matthew the way you would the Lord of the Rings. You wouldn't do that because you have to pay attention to the various types of literature. So context is key. Next, a literal exegesis. Literal exegesis. So now, again, the word exegesis comes from the Greek word exegesis, and it means to draw out. The picture is of lowering a bucket down in a well, and then you exegete the water out of the well. You draw it out. You draw it up. And so, literal exegesis has to do with the literal meaning of the text. What is this? Literal texts explain, explain metaphorical ones. Figures of speech, including metaphors, riddles, aphorisms, proverbs, parables, allegories, all of these things are in the Bible. And they have literal reference. What do we mean by this? Well, abstract figures of speech have to be interpreted by literal figures of speech. They're both figures of speech. But the abstract is interpreted by the concrete. Let me give you an example of this. You can't know that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed unless you know that the kingdom of God is not a mustard seed, right? So, like, if, if you don't know that the kingdom of God is not a mustard seed, then you can't know how it's like a mustard seed. Revelation 2, 3, uh, chapters 2 and 3. You can't know that the church is like a lampstand unless you know what a lampstand is and what a church is. But you can know how that one thing is an analogy of the other thing if you know what they both literally are. So the literal determines the metaphorical. You can't even determine figures of speech or metaphors without literal uh, reference, without a literal grounding. Now, let me say this. Some of you are just way too literal. And I've been this way too. I, I have made this mistake of going to the Bible and trying to press it and squeeze it for every literalistic thing that I can get out of it. That's a, that is a mistake. That is a tragic mistake. And Jesus had to deal with this in the first century. When the disciples after the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. Remember that story? Remember what they forgot? What did they forget? Twelve baskets fulls. <laughs> like they're loading up the boat. They're getting all their gear and everything back on the boat. And I love this moment. They're just chatting. They're talking. They're getting their gear ready. And Jesus just walks by them and he goes, hey, uh, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. And he just, <laughs> and they're like, what? And they drop everything they're doing. They start having this argument about, oh, no, we forgot the bread. And Jesus has to turn around saying, I'm not talking about bread. <laughs> like, I'm talking about the evil yeast of the Pharisee that can worm its way into your heart and into your mind. He was speaking metaphorically. Uh, what about uh, Nicodemus? Nicodemus comes at night, right? He, Dick at night, he comes and he says, uh, G and he says to Jesus, he says, uh, hey, master, you're a wonderful teacher. And Jesus says, look, Nicodemus, you can't even uh, go into the kingdom of God unless you be born again. And what does he do? He says, well, how can I go back through my mother's womb? And Jesus says, good grief. I'm talking metaphorically. You have to be born of water and you have to be born of the spirit. You have to be born as a human being and then you have to be born anew from heaven by the Spirit. And so be careful not to press the text for over-literalism, but the literal principle of exegesis is critical. It is critical. Next is what we call correlating exegesis. This is also known as the analogy of Scripture. I don't like that title. So I came up with my own. Correlating exegesis. It's better. Trust me. Now, plain texts explain obscure ones. Just as literal texts can explain metaphorical ones, Plain texts explain obscure ones. Fuller texts explain sparse ones. So, this text in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where Paul says this, women are to remain silent, <laughs> right, and to learn at home. What does that mean? Well, you got to know the context. Context is he's already uh, 
He's already prescribed silence for everyone there in that church who's talking out of turn. That's the first thing you need to know, so look at the context. Second thing you need to know is that women are represented in the New Testament, and they are featured in the New Testament as occupying just about every role of leadership with the exception of the local elder. So we have female prophetesses. We have female deacons. We have female apostles. Uh, we have female teachers and evangelists. So in just about every teaching, proclamation, leadership office in the New Testament, you find women mentioned. So obviously Paul is not talking about that. See, those plain scriptures are now helping you to understand an, an obscure one. And also the historical background will help you too. Because here's the other thing you'll learn. You'll learn that in the ancient Greco-Roman world, with the exception of a few prominent women, women were treated as property. They were not allowed to be educated. So now three different times in the New Testament, the New Testament commands the men to educate and disciple the women at home. Why? Because the Christian faith wants its women discipled so that they can make disciples, so that they can teach others the gospel. Now, when you understand that context, now you understand the clear passages explain the obscure one. What about canonical exegesis? Every text must be interpreted in light of all the texts. Every text must be interpreted in light of all the texts. Now, the canon here just means the fixed rule. It just means the collection. So we have a collection, and it's closed. It's the Old and New Testament. It's a closed canon. And we go to every, every passage that we interpret, we interpret in light of the whole story, the whole counsel of God. Let me give you an example of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's pick on the Corinthians again. And uh, baptism for the dead. Have you heard this? Right? I'm sure you have from your neighbors, right? So baptism from the dead. Are we supposed to be practicing that? I highly doubt it. Now, Paul does three things in that chapter. The first one is he does not command that practice. He also doesn't commend it. He doesn't say, good job for practicing baptism of the dead. He doesn't say that, but he also doesn't censure it. So it's not a deal breaker. If somebody does that, it's not going to send them to hell. It's just unwise, right? So in the very context, Paul does not command it. He does not commend it, but he also doesn't censure it, but he uses it as an example to prove his point. People are baptizing for the dead, and if they weren't doing that, then why would you say that there's not going to be a resurrection? What, are, what is their hope? Why are they doing that? So he's using it as a polemic. It's just an example. Now, how do we know the church did not interpret Paul to, uh, to, uh, to import this idea into the ecclesiology or the life of the church? How do we know that? Well, successive generations didn't do it. And two, none of the rest of Scripture speaks to it at all. There is no passage in the Old Testament or the New Testament that clarifies that or that teaches it. So we bring the whole canon, the whole collection to that one obscure text. And we say, okay, well, it's probably not wise for us to, to uh, uh, create an entire apparatus of baptism for the dead. That's not wise. What about Christological exegesis? Well, Jesus is the consummative and integrating focus of all the scripture. That's such a nerdy thing to say. That's like the nerdiest thing I could possibly say to you. But it's true. Jesus consummates. He brings the entirety of scripture to its fulfillment, to its completion, its consummation, right? He is the consummative and integrative focal point of the entire scripture. The whole scripture revolves around him. It leads to him and it leads from him and then back to him. And so Jesus, we look at the Old Testament through the lenses of the cross. We look at the Old Testament, we interpret it from the mission and person of Jesus. And this is what we mean by Christological or Christ-centered exegesis. And then lastly is moralizing application. Have you ever gone back to the Old Testament and looked at a story and thought, oh man, that's a really cool story. I should be doing that. And then the very next thing, that same character is acting in a way that is not exactly <laughs> righteous. I mean, I think of David, right? Now, it's perfectly appropriate for you and I to go back to the Old Testament and moralize, to get moral principles. It's perfectly appropriate for you and I to go back to a story like David and say, hey man, this guy was faithful. He was a man after God's own heart. Don't sleep around, <laughs> right? So there's a negative example there too. Like don't kill your best friend. Don't do that. 
So it has both a negative and positive moralizing principle. Now, these are ways in which we study the Scriptures. The Bereans were diligently looking into their Scriptures to see if what Paul said squared with what the Word says. And this is why I love Christ Community Church, because this is the kind of church that God has made us. Amen? Amen. Amen. You're the Bereans. Awesome. Number two, the second thing seems clear to me is that a nobler culture chooses reasoned discourse. A nobler culture chooses not only to welcome the Scriptures and to welcome the truth of the Bible, but it chooses reasoned discourse in those areas of dispute. The word reason here is the word dialegami or dialectaeon, and it's where we get the word dialect. And it just means to reason it out, to sit down and through the tools of rational discourse to think some things through. It means to instruct, discuss, or argue one's case, frequently resulting in an exchange of opinions. So this is going to result now in an exchange of opinions. This is how Paul preached. This is how the New Testament church shared its faith with the people who didn't believe what they believed. And so if the Bereans show us anything, it's their willingness to examine truth claims against the Scriptures, against God's Word, to enter into a spirit, spirited dialogue over these matters. And they do. Look at chapter 17, verse 2. We see that reason discourse is to be our normal convention of proclamation. Reason discourse is to be our normal convention of proclamation. It says in verse 2, as usual, as customarily, like as was his pattern. Paul went into the synagogue, and on the Sabbath days he reasoned dialegami, with them from the Scriptures. And this is to be our custom, folks, to regularly, routinely engage in reason, principled conversation over truths as they relate to God's Word. And some of you have shared some, over the last few weeks, you've shared some wonderful stories with me, and I love it. I cherish every story that you share with me about just sharing the truth with someone who was a little confused on something that they've been taught somewhere else and you guys have just brought up the word and said, hey, let's cross-examine that with the scriptures. I love that. You're the Bereans. And this was Paul's pattern. We also practice reason discourse, which takes place in the church and the marketplace. It is to be done in the church and in the marketplace of ideas that compete with the truth. Look at verse 17. It says, so he reasoned the elegami in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worship God and, as well, in the marketplace, every day, with those who happen to be there. So this is an appropriate form of discussing and sharing and dialoguing, proclaiming the truth, whether you're in church or downtown, whether you're in church or not in church, or at a dinner with a friend. It's to be done both in, with the people of God in the place where they meet and also in the community. And reason discourse is how we persuade people to believe. This is why I'm not a presuppositionalist. If you don't know what that is, just write that down. You can Google that later. But I'm not a presuppositionalist. I believe it takes strong arguments supported by evidence to persuade people that the gospel is true, and that's what the Holy Spirit uses. Look at verse 4 of chapter 18. It says, he reasoned dialegami in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jew and Jews and Greeks. What is he doing? He's trying to make his case. He's trying to persuade these people who don't believe. He's trying to say, here are the arguments for Jesus as Christ. Here's the truth. Here are the arguments, and here's the evidence. The evidence is undeniable. You must wrestle with the evidence. And so if the Bereans and Paul teach us anything, they show us the importance of warmly receiving God's message about Jesus Christ and diligently studying it to see if it squares with the Old Testament. And Paul shows us that we must engage in a reasonable argumentation for the gospel, seeking to persuade people that it's true. And thirdly, a nobler, a nobler culture chooses moral excellence. A nobler culture chooses moral excellence. Moral excellence is quite simply the quality of choosing the good and not the bad. Moral excellence is the quality of choosing the right and not the wrong. I want to show you this in Isaiah chapter 5. 
Isaiah 5, 12 through 13, here's what he says. They do not perceive the Lord's action. Who? Judah. He's talking about Judah. He's talking about the people of God who are supposed to be the people of God. They're supposed to be worshiping God, but they don't. And he says, these people, they do not perceive the Lord's actions. And they do not seek the works or see the work of his hands. They fail to acknowledge God. What happens when we fail to acknowledge God? Some very bad things. <laughs> Super not good on the good and bad scale. And therefore, my people will go into exile because they lack knowledge. Going into exile, being estranged from God, is the consequence of lacking knowledge of God and of what he has done. Moral excellence begins with acknowledging what the Lord has done and not what I have done. It begins with acknowledging that God has done it all and he has invited me in. He has invited me to become a partaker. His mighty deeds, his sovereign care, his provision of grace. And Judah had failed to acknowledge all that God, Yahweh, had done. And thus they forgot him. Because they did not, they failed to acknowledge him, they forgot him, and then they became their own gods. And once you become your own god, everything's on the table. You will spiral, you can spiral into moral oblivion, and that is what we see is happening in our very culture. This is what Paul is talking about in Romans 1, 18 through 28. In Romans 1, 18 through 28, what he's saying is, is the human race has displaced God. The human race has removed God from his throne. They have attributed God's works to everything else, every other thing imaginable. And then what happens there between 18 and 28? Moral oblivion, spiraling into moral failure. And that is exactly what we see in our culture today. Look at verse 28. It says, and since they did not see fit to retain the knowledge of God, they did not see fit to acknowledge God. What's their problem? Just like the Judeans, right? The ancient Judeans of Isaiah chapter 5, God says, you don't acknowledge what I've done. And when you don't acknowledge what God has done as creator, you fail to acknowledge him. And so what does God do? God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. This is the result of a culture that does not acknowledge God anymore. And moral excellence is possible through divine resources. So here's what I want to say. Morality is possible by sinners, right? Not, not every person who doesn't believe in Jesus, right? Not every person who hasn't affirmed the truth of the gospel is as immoral as they could possibly be. Otherwise, civil society would not even be possible. But listen, moral excellence is not possible. Moral excellence is not possible apart from divine resources. I want to show you this in 2 Peter 1.3. I want to show you this passage. He says, his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness. What do you not have for life and godliness? Where do you get it? From his divine power, the power of the Holy Spirit. Through the knowledge, how does it come? Through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. This is why we exist to make disciples who gather to worship God in spirit and in truth and who grow, grow in the knowledge, the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ because this is how you get it. God says, my divine power is available to you through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are encouraged and challenged to grow in our knowledge. Not just our head knowledge, but our heart knowledge. Not just in what we know about Christ, but the fact that we know Christ and we walk in relationship with him. And Peter says, everything we need for life, everything we need for godliness is through his divine power, through knowledge. So our message to our dying culture, and it's dying. You know the culture's dying, right? Isn't that hard? Isn't that painful to watch someone you love die? I can tell you from personal experience, that is very painful. And it's very painful. If you, do you love your country? I hope you do. And it's painful to watch it die. It's painful to watch it morally implode. But this is why it's morally imploding. Because it lacks nobility of character. And it does so because it has dislodged God from his throne. 
or at least it thinks it has. It's going to be kind of a shock later. Um, so our message to our dying friend, our dying culture, our dying world is, listen, our culture is headed off a moral cliff here. Our society is like a freight train on fire headed into oblivion. And we appeal to you as ambassador of Christ, be, be reconciled to God in Jesus. Escape the coming wrath. Receive Jesus and receive sonship. Receive sonship. And we appeal to our religious or non-religious friends who share our concerns about the moral depravity of our culture, and we appeal to them too. And we say, listen, it's not even possible. It's not possible unless you have been reconciled in Jesus Christ because the divine power comes through the knowledge of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Why don't you pray with me? Father in heaven, we just thank you for this word which the Bereans took to heart. God, they've given us a living example of what it's like to diligently study and seek the word, to examine it to see if a truth claim is really true. And I thank you, Lord, for this church that does just that. Ever since I first met these folks six years ago, Lord, you have given this body of believers a burden, a heart to study, a heart to know, a heart to grow. And God, I just pray that you would help us to make this appeal as ambassadors in our culture. Would you help us? In your heart, would you just commit to that right now? God, I am, I am going to appeal to this culture. I am going to appeal to my neighbors. I am going to appeal to this lost and dying world that is collapsing under the weight of immorality and sin and idolatry. God, I commit to sharing the good news, to sharing the light of the truth. We commit to it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.